Good morning, church. What an amazing week. Um, you know, the, uh, I say amazing, draining. Draining is probably a better word. The election in America, uh, the lockdown again. Um, if you're not careful, what these things can do is when they're protracted, they can drain you. And, you know, we need to keep ourselves sharp and alive on the inside. Worship is a great thing singing out to God in, in, in the privacy of your own home or, uh, you know, reading the Bible or reading an inspirational book. Uh, sometimes I, I love reading autobiographies and, and, and biographies and it's, it, it's just, it sharpens you up. Go on, we've got to learn to feed ourselves. When we first started Global, uh, a, a phrase that we used a lot and, and we're beginning to use it again for, for, for new people and that is, let's become self-feeders. Not waiting for other people to bring good stuff to us, but learn how to, to feed on God's word, on the Bible itself. I was to, learning how to feed on direct from the Holy Spirit. How exciting is that? Be filled with the Spirit every day. God can flip wisdom and insights and revelation into you, into your mind, into your heart. And, uh, you, you know, it just changes the course of your day. God can give you restraint and 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 uh you know you wouldn't where you you're set to do a certain thing but you you, you just think now i'm not going to do that and you restrain yourself you restrain the natural response and you go uh, with wisdom rather than frustration or anger so election what a funny word um what a funny election i should say donald trump and uh, joe biden um, I want to talk about that word election today because the Bible says that you and I are chosen and elected by Jesus and uh, that that makes us special. <laughs> don't, don't tell your friends. That makes us special. So today I want to look at being handpicked. You and I are handpicked as believers. We often get asked, how did you find Jesus? Well, we never knew we were lost, to be fair. How did you find Jesus? And really, the question should be the opposite. How did Jesus find us? Uh, you see, the Bible says that God always makes the first move in our salvation. What is salvation? It's the nearest word we have in English is to be salvaged, where God uh, takes hold of our lives that were intended to be this, but they've been damaged by Satan and by sin and by bad choices in life. And he salvages it, he restores it and renovates it back to its former glory. And so God always makes the first move in salvation. He makes the first move every time. In the beginning, it says, God said, let there be light. And there was light because God takes the initiative. He's took the initiative in getting the gospel to come to your door. How amazing is that? Your house. And you and I have believed. And do you know something? We can trace that right back down the centuries to 120 people that were in an upper room praying for the Holy Spirit after Jesus had just ascended into heaven. And 2,000 years ago, the Holy Spirit fell upon them believers and the gospel came from those 120 down the centuries to us. We can trace whoever it was that, that introduced us to the gospel, we can trace it right back to that 120. And Jesus, the Son of God, instigated that. And the Father and Jesus and the Holy Spirit instigated creation before that. And uh, it's just amazing. So I want to have a look at this choosing. And it's known amongst mature believers as the doctrine of election. God elects, he chooses you and he elects you. He did with, with Israel. And Israel were meant to be uh, a shining light to the other nations. So when God elects you, he gives you responsibility. He gives you, or another word for that is purpose. He elects us for a purpose. He chooses us for a purpose. Many believers wonder how God could choose you and me before uh, we were born or had any existence. That's what he did. And how he could elect us and give us free will uh, to choose to follow and serve him. So he elects us without our permission. And yet he gives us free will to choose. And he holds us responsible for our choices. It's a funny thing. But, you know, we don't have to worry about it. Yes, the, the, uh, the question of free will and God's uh, choice of us, you know, did we choose him? Did he choose us? No, he definitely chose us first. 
and he brought it he brought our awareness our awareness of him to us and we had the the, the choice we had to make a choice and we've chosen and we've said yes and it, at first it feels like we've chosen him but the more you look at it he's worked it in so that we've chosen him because he chose us first um but this the, the you know the dilemma of god's uh choice and our choice goes on it's gone on for centuries we don't have to understand the laws of electricity to live in the good of electricity and likewise we don't have to understand the laws of election and free will uh we just uh live in the good of it that god has handpicked us and he has somehow worked his weaved his way into our lives and we have said yes do you know something i believe he's done that with other people and they've said no and this this i've got reason to believe that in the bible he weaved his way into judas's life and for three years he said yes and then he said no so he, 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 god chose uh, a, a generation to go into the promised land they said no so they didn't get in but the children got in uh, so I believe in free will I'm, I'm a strong advocate of free will but when you realize that God has chosen you and he's weaved his will into your life so that you so that you, you hear the gospel and you choose him you realize wow he wanted me before I was born before I was a, a magnificent personality before I were great at, at my job or great at leading worship or preaching or being a school teacher or whatever, a business a businessman or a businesswoman. Um, God chose us before he even created creation. That is amazing. Um, but let me have a, 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 a let, let, let me give you an example of this creation, of his choosing, I should say. God chose his own people and he had to let them know because they get proud and we can get proud too but they got proud and, and he, he had to remind them uh, in deuteronomy he says for you are a people holy to the lord your god the lord your god has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be his people his treasured possession this is god speaking to israel years ago thousands of years ago the lord did not set his affection on you and choose you because you were more numerous than other peoples, for you were the fewest of all peoples. So you weren't spectacular. That's what he was saying to them. But it was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath he swore to your ancestors that, uh, that he brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the land of slavery, from the power of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God. He is the faithful God, keeping the covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commandments. And then later on, Jesus said this in John chapter 15. Uh, that first scripture was from Deuteronomy 7, chapter 7, verses 6 and 9. John 15 says this, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit and fruit that will last so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. Uh, in Galatians, Paul says, but the fruit, Jesus has said, you've been chosen and, 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 uh, and appointed to bear fruit, a fruit that will last. Paul takes this thought up and he says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. It says against these things, there's no law. But you know, if you want love, joy, peace, people think I'm trying to be more loving, I'm trying to be more patient. No, can I give you a shortcut? See, these talks are for new believers, really. But older believers can get some stuff from them as well. Let me give you a shortcut. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. When you are filled with the Holy Spirit, all these nine flavors of the one fruit, it's one fruit, nine flavors. The fruit of the Spirit is in you immediately. And immediately you're full of love, joy, peace. You don't even know why. And after a while, you, you, you realise that within your character, there isn't love, there isn't patience, there isn't these things. But the more you fill with the Holy Spirit, it starts to rework your inwards, your, your inward thought processes and everything. And you start to become more loving, more kind, more peaceful, 
all them kind of things. But get filled with the spirit, all nine flavours hit you all at once. What a buzz. <laughs> so, um, we, we, we're called to bear fruit and the fruit of the spirit. What's the fruit like in your life? In terms of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. Wow. The first three are about our insides, love, joy, peace. The second three are about our attitudes to others, patience, kindness, goodness. And uh, and the last three, I don't know what they're about, the faithfulness, gentleness and self-control about our behaviours. Uh, I think that's probably what it is. That's in Galatians uh, chapter 5 verses 22 to 25. And it also says this. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let me give you another one. In fact, Ephesians 2.10, it says, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So there's good works for us to do, that's fruits, fruits of our lives, but there's also fruit on the inside of us, love, joy, peace, patience, and Jesus says, go and produce fruit. There's a third type of fruit, and that is where you help others to find faith in Jesus. You're bearing much fruit, more believers are being born. It's fantastic. So fruit on the inside, fruit on the outside. What does fruit represent in the Bible? It represents success. Um, because, you know, fruit on, on trees or, or, or vines or whatever, they produce an harvest and they produce finances. It's usually part of a business. And so Jesus wants us to be successful uh, and, and successful on the inside, successful on the outside. He's pointless having a beautiful business or uh, 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 doing brilliantly at work or in your career, but on the inside, you're a nasty piece of work. Are you not great to be around? And Jesus wants us to be fruitful on the inside, fruitful on the outside. Um, but Jesus in John chapter 15, he says he, 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 that God has chosen us uh, and, and, and he's appointed us to bear fruit and fruit that will last. What is fruit that will last? It's sustained success. So it's not just success, but it's sustained success. Maybe I'm speaking to a business person today and you're having success, but you're nervous. You're thinking, when's it all going to go wrong? You, you have thoughts, don't you, that attack your mind. And, uh, you know, with Jesus, you can be confident that you know he wants you to have sustained success. And uh, here's a great promise in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. It says, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ. And that was my baptism verse. And you know, as a new believer, I was always frightened of backsliding. I thought, I'm going to mess up. I'm going to stuff up. I know I'm, 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 I'm a mess. <laughs> and uh, the, the pastor at the time, he, he shared that verse with me. He said, I think God wants you to uh, have this promise. And that has helped me being confident, confident of this. God wants us to be confident, not lily livered and, oh, it's not me, it's the Lord, I don't really know what I'm doing. All that is silliness. Being confident, God loves confidence. He loves to instill in his kids confidence. Uh, the devil hates confidence and he robs you of your confidence. So whatever's robbing you at the moment of your confidence, know that the devil's using it to rob you and get all the God's word. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work, see, it starts with God. And if it starts with him, It'll finish with him. If he starts with you, well, who knows? But if it starts with him, then it'll finish with him. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion. So there we go. Completers, that's what we need to be. So God took the first step in choosing us. Salvation is not about man groping after God. Where are you? Is there a God? Which God is it? It's God reaching down to man. God was in Christ, the Bible says, reconciling the world to himself. Jesus said, I have come down to do the will of him who sent me. John chapter 6. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, so that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It starts with God. Yeah, your salvation starts with God. So he's got you in his hand. So don't worry about 
can I keep this up? Can I keep, I don't think I can keep following God. And you know, there's that many distractions. No, keep close and he'll carry you through and your confidence will grow and you'll know how his word works and how to work his word. And it's beautiful. God chooses us and yet he has given us free will to decide whether to follow him or not. And he holds us responsible for our choice. John chapter three, verse 36, uh, 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 an incredible verse, a, a scary verse. It says, whoever believes in the son has eternal life. That's me and you. But it says this, but whoever rejects the son will not see life for God's wrath remains on them. You know, whoever rejects, you can only reject what you've been offered. And many, many people get offered to believe in Jesus and they're too busy, too clever, too bright, too this, too that. But Jesus, you know, I don't need a crutch. Um, and that's all they see. And they walk away and they're lied to by the devil and they're lied to by their own clever, cleverness. Some people are cleverer than Christ. I want us to be humble. And we humble ourselves and we say, you know, God, I can do many things in life, but I cannot escape the judgment that's to come. And you know, that's how I started my Christianity, fear of hell. But when I started to get to know Jesus, I realized he had more for me in this life, never mind the life to come. And his wisdom and his insight, and he can make things happen to you. You know, people say they were in the right place at the right time. Another word for that is God's favor. Well, you don't deserve what's just about to happen to you. And you step into something, you think, what happened here? I remember getting properties with no money. How do you do that? Oh, that's God's favour on my life. With some properties, I even got money back, cash back. That's incredible. Absolute miracles. That was got me stepping into God's favour. You know what God started? He'll finish. Keep walking with God. Don't give up. So, he who has the Son has eternal life. God has weaved his way into your life and my life. It's beautiful. When were you chosen? Well, I've already said, really. It wasn't after uh, we'd lived for a while and we'd shown how talented we were. Uh, you know, <clears throat> here's Dave Shore. The Lord has given him a great gift in worship. <laughs> There's none of that. Here we have the august man of God. No, 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 no. Here we have the great mother. Here we have the great singer, the great, um, you know, inventor or whatever. It was none of that. It was before you and I was born. Uh, or, and, and before we'd done anything, good or bad. And in fact, Romans, uh, the Apostle Paul, he wrote uh, the book of Romans, and academics love this book, Christian academics, because it's full of insights about God's character. It's incredible. And, uh, and Paul's using the argument about being called and chosen before we did anything good or bad. Uh, it was just God's sovereign choice. Uh, and it starts like this, Romans 9, chapter 9, verses 10 and 12. It's good for you to, to, to bring pen and paper or, or take, take the, the scriptures, um, you know, as I say them. And then you can underline them in your Bible. And that's how you get to know your Bible. Paul says, not only that, but Rebecca's children were conceived at the same time by our father, father Isaac. He's talking about Isaac, whose father was Abraham. Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, three generations and he's talking about how, how, how they had twins. And it's, it says, yet before the twins were born, or had done anything, good or bad, in order that God's purposes in election might stand, not by works, but by him who calls. She was told the older will serve the younger. Usually it's the other way around. The younger serves the older. But God knew, he foreknew before they were even born, before they'd done good or bad, he said, the older one will serve the younger. And that was in order for God's purpose in election uh, to stand. And he's saying, God called them. Call, he calls believers before they're even born. So you and I were called and chosen before the world was created. That goes even further back than when we were born. Can you see this is too much for our minds, but I want you to know it from the scriptures so that you know you're not an accident. Because evolution says you're an accident. You're taught in school you're an accident. Sometimes your parents will say you were Saturday night and we didn't. We, we just had some good fun on a Saturday night. We didn't want any more kids. 
you were an accident. And I want to say today, categorically, you were not an accident. God chose you before the foundation of the world. Your parents were mere instruments in getting you here. You know, you, you came through your parents, but you came from God. Get hold of that truth. That's for somebody this morning. Stop thinking you were an accident. Stop thinking you were unwanted. You know, whether a parent wants you or not, God wants you. He's chosen you. And he's chosen you for a purpose. And you know something? The pain of not being wanted can be melted away when you meet the right person. And God can weave that person into your world. He can do so much more than what we could do on our own. Being a Christian is phenomenal. I absolutely love it. I see miracles happening to people's lives uh, daily. And I would not swap this life for any other. There's nothing that comes anywhere near it. Ephesians 1, chapter, uh, chapter 1, verse 4 says this. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy, that means set apart, and blameless in his sight. In love, it says, he predestined us. So, for he chose us in him before the creation of the world. And the purpose was to be set apart for his purposes. So how did God choose us? If he chose us before we were born, then it couldn't have been because we were somehow brilliant and and really pleasing to him. God's choice, this is God's choice, was simply due to his amazing grace and his mercy. Listen to these scriptures, so good. Titus chapter 3, verses 3 to 5. I hope you're following me. I hope I'm not going too fast. This is amazing. It says, at one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. You know that God's not He's not against uh, desires. God's not against sex. He created sex. He's not against us having a good time. What, what Paul's talking about is where your desires have got out of control and you're led by your pleasures and, and your passions. You, you have, you have you, you, you know, and it's sinful passions and pleasures. Not, not uh, I'm not talking about where painting and decorating is your passion. <laughs> that was good. But sinful pleasures. It says that we lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of our God, uh, of God, our Saviour appeared, he saved us. Not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth, that's baptism, and the renewal by the Holy Spirit, re-energised, reformed by the Holy Spirit, regenerated into the image of God. How fantastic, Titus chapter 3, verses 3 to 5. Paul contrasted it, our lives then, but our lives now. But God, when his kindness appeared, he saved us not because of righteous things we have done, but because of his mercy. Great word, that mercy. Keep hold of that word. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 9 to 10 says this. He saved us and called us to a holy life not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. Keep hold of that word. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Saviour, Jesus Christ, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. He saved us and called us, yeah? Not because of anything that we had done, but because of his own purpose and grace. God created human beings for his pleasure. And even worship, we say, oh, I really enjoyed worship today. I got a lot of worship really is for him. (laughs) But anyway, we learn as we go along. What is mercy? Mercy is not, is God not giving us what we deserve, what our attitudes, actions and lifestyles deserve which is eternal punishment and hell. What's grace? Grace is God giving us what our attitudes, actions and lifestyles don't deserve. So mercy is God not giving us what we deserve. Grace is God giving us what we don't deserve, which is everlasting life. 
God's full and overflowing love and provision for fruitful, energised lives. And none of this are we worthy of. When people say, you're worth it, you, you're, uh, you deserve it, that's, that's the word, you deserve it, we don't, we don't. But you know what? We get it anyway from Jesus. It's just amazing. We get everything from, you know, God, God the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Brilliant. Let me tell you this. You were a gift of love from the Father to the Son. Uh, if we read John chapter 6, verse 37, Jesus said, All those the Father gives me will come to me. He's talking about human beings now, individuals. All those the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. You and I came to Jesus, not primarily because we decided to, but because the Father drew us to Jesus. No one can come to Jesus without the Father drawing them. Can I just read uh, John chapter 6, that same chapter, but verse 44. Jesus said, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them and I will raise them up at the last day. And you know, that helps us when we're sharing our faith with people, helping people to, to believe and people walk away sometimes. And you're like, I thought you would have got this. And they, they, they don't. And, you know, we've got to look and say, is the Father drawing them? One of the things I've noticed with people is they're often, you keep bumping into people, the same people, and you know that the Father's drawing them. Just a little thing that I found out over the years. And you share your faith and eventually, uh, you know, they become Christians because the Father's drawing them. Watch for those people. Next point, your lifestyle doesn't shock God. God knew all about you before you had lived one day of your life and he still chose you. That should help you to relax a little bit. Peter, a close friend of Jesus, wrote this. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect, exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia and Bithynia, who have, give, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, this is a mouthful, to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. And he's there saying, you know, you who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, God knew you long before you were born. We just don't understand that. That's beyond us. But God is beyond us. So despite your weaknesses, your frailty, and your sinfulness, God wanted you. Out of millions, he has chosen you. You are special. You are handpicked, and so am I. And that should make you feel good about yourself. Learn to accept yourself. That's my next point. God has chosen you and created you as he wanted you to be. He has given you your body, your personality, and your giftings. Using the death of his son on the cross, he has brought you back out of slavery to Satan and sin and selfishness and sickness. And so, you know, we can, we can be ourselves. And it's so good to learn to be yourself. Don't crave to be someone else, to have somebody else's looks, somebody else's personality and temperament or natural gifts. Be yourself. Find out who you are. He said, but I don't like myself. You will. You will. It won't, it won't take too long. You will. And you start to realise how loved you are by God. And God does love the unlovable. I'm just saying he does. But then you become lovable because you become like him. You get transformed into his likeness. Uh, Romans chapter 8 verse 29, being predestined into the likeness of his son. He said, but I don't like this and I don't like that about myself. Romans chapter 9 verses 20 and 21 says, but who are you, a human being, to talk back to God? Shall what is formed say to the one who formed it, why did you make me like this? Does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some pottery for special purposes and some for common use? And Paul's saying, just go with the flow God's made you and you'll start to find your true identity and your, your tr true happiness and satisfaction if you'll go God's way. Psalm 139 Verses 13 to 16, it says, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. 
Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. So, my last point, the pressure is off. Now, because God has chosen you and made you, and he's drawn you to the Saviour, Jesus, you no longer have to feel everything now depends on me. I've got, I've got to have what it takes. If I'm going to be a faithful believer, if, if, if I'm going to be a good mum or a good dad or a good sister or a brother or, or, or a son or a daughter, being successful in my career or a calling, you, you don't have to have it all together because God is with you. All his resources now become your resources. Philippians 4.19 And my God will meet all your needs, all your needs, according to his riches in Christ Jesus. Philippians 4.19 Philippians 4 chapter uh, verse 12 says, I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to be in plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, living in plenty or in want. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, who gives me strength. That's so good. 2 Corinthians 12 verse 9 says, But God said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. If you're feeling weak in your faith, if you're feeling weak as a human being, God's grace can work through you because you're a novice in the new. You're learning the ropes. And uh, last of all, God has a perfect plan for you. And we are his handiwork, as I was saying before. We've been created in Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance. We're not do-gooders. We don't just go and do anything that's good. We've got to listen to the Holy Spirit to show us the good works that he's got lined up for us. Don't just go and jump in and, and, and just go, there's a good work here and a good work that you'll exhaust yourself. Let the Holy Spirit lead you to the works that he's prepared in advance. And you know, Jeremiah chapter 29 says, verse 11 and 12, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and give you, uh, and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. You'll seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. You may not know yet what his plan is for you. But as you read your Bible and get filled with the Holy Spirit every day, then uh, God will unfold his plans for you step by step. And, you know, God uh, will lead you by his Holy Spirit. That's why it's important to be filled with the Spirit. I've said plenty today. It's just gone way too fast. There's more of this coming your way and I want to keep reading the scriptures to you because I'm building a foundation from the Bible in your life. The Bible, it's like building your life on the rock. And uh, the storms of life come, but you know something, you don't get budged because you don't go off your feelings, you don't go off airy-fairy thoughts, you stick with what the scriptures say and they are eternal and everlasting. Psalm 119 says, your word, O Lord, has been established in the heavens. It's not being established. It is established. Maybe today you've never given your life to Jesus Christ. And I'm going to invite you just to say a simple prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for choosing me. When you sent your son to die on the cross, you had me in mind. I thank you, Lord, that the sacrifice Jesus made has brought forgiveness to me. I receive your forgiveness for all my sins. It's brought eternal life to me. I receive today that eternal life in Jesus. And it's given me new power. And I receive that new power. Power to transform and to change and to follow you every day. I receive you, Holy Spirit, into my life. And I say thank you, Lord. Amen. Let us know if you've said that prayer. Get in touch with us. And uh, I would like to say, if you're wherever you are in the world listening in, I know people listen throughout Britain and throughout other nations. Get in touch with us if you want to plant churches. We're all about making disciples, planting churches, reaching cities. You might not live in a big city, but you know what? Get in touch with us anyway, because you can be part of the movement as we go forward. So it's great that you're listening in. Talk about these things uh, on the phone, on the Zoom, on the chats or whatever it is. 
And you know, let's be strong in the Lord. Let's keep believing. And during this lockdown, you know, keep your nut sound, you know, read the word, speak to your friends, keep walking. If you're in trouble, ask for help. Ask for help. Yeah, Here's, I'm signing off. Great speaking to you and keep yourself strong. See you soon. Thank <laughs> you.